Hello, and welcome to Star, Cells, and God, the show where we discuss new discoveries taking place at the frontiers of scientific research that have theological and philosophical implications, as well as new discoveries that point to the reality of God's existence. My name is Hugh Ross, and today we're going to be exploring two topics. One, do atoms think, or what do you think about atoms? And I'll be talking about uh, new advances uh, in terms of the getting green energy sources at a cheap price. But before we begin into these discussions, I want to encourage you to subscribe to our channel, our Reasons to Believe YouTube channel, so you can be notified of our new weekly videos. Learn more at reasons.org or by following us on social media at rtb underscore official. Well, today I'm joined by Tom Beeler. He's part of our Reasons to Believe Scholar community. And uh, Tom, I was looking at your bio. It's uh, quite impressive. I understand you did uh, work at Sandia National Laboratories. Not the one in New Mexico, but the one in Livermore. Uh, I've been to both places. It's quite an outstanding uh, institution. And uh, your PhD is in material science. And you've done a lot of work on material science, superconducting material, uh, titanium. And uh, I remember being in Russia, flying on one of those Aeroflot airplanes that did not have titanium. And it's like, okay, how old is this plane? <laughs> and uh, what's going to happen? Because uh, titanium is significant material for uh, aircraft safety. Uh, but you've come here with a very interesting topic, atoms. And uh, the, the importance that atoms play in your worldview. So I'm really fascinated. Where are you going to take this discussion? Well, I'm, I've been interested in this partly because it's what we do in teaching students in material science. The course that I teach at a core course in uh, junior level class is uh, called Fundamentals of Microstructural Design. And that... Uh, focuses on how to get atoms into the arrangements we want them in in order to make a useful material. And so for that reason, I've wanted to help students get a sense of what atoms are and what do we know about atoms and what do we think, how do we think about them? Because what you think about atoms has everything to do with everything else in life, because after all, we're made out of them. But right. more importantly, issues of theism or atheism are all tied up in what atoms are. So that's, so I wanted to give students a broader view. Yeah, well, just as an astrophysicist, I kind of take a little different perspective on it. The miracle that atoms even exist, <laughs> uh, or the idea that you could have atoms, but how do you keep them stable? Yeah. And all the amazing designs you need to have stable atoms and stable molecules. So guide us where you want to go. Okay, so... Uh, the second lecture in this class that I give, and I've squeezed this down into a much shorter version, is basically to challenge students about cultural ideas about atoms. And this is the sense of it. Uh, I want to look at atoms from two points of view, a Judeo-Christian point of view and an atheistic point of view, which really started with Epicurus. And so they have their ups and downs, and its atoms are totally tied up in this epic drama. And the key part of the subtext, subtitle of this is how the West became schizophrenic. Okay. Because in the 20th century, there was a divergence between the arts and the humanities and science and how they look at things. And, and I'll get to that when we get there. So you're saying artists look at atoms a little bit differently than physicists and chemists? Absolutely. Well, okay. I, that, I, I think ultimately they do, but they may not realize it. Right. So uh, sacrifices have always been a part of what people do in history. And, of course, why do people make sacrifices is interesting. This is sort of a, a preliminary thought to this before we get to atoms, because worshiping God is always been there. And so people do it for a variety of reasons, maybe to gain favor or to gain power or to protect themselves from disasters or to recognize that one life has to die for another one to live, which is, I think, really interesting. And I think that's even embodied in the laws of physics, like conservation of energy and the second law. Um, so we had a chance to visit 
place called Çatalhöyük in uh, Turkey, which is one of the oldest cities that ever existed. And the whole question of oral history, and is it reliable, such as the story of Adam and Eve. Uh, and so in this place, there's perhaps the oldest landscape or the oldest map that's known. And it may so depict... So how old is the map? It's uh, 9,000 years ago. Wow. wow. And so this is possibly a depiction of a volcano erupting. Mm -hmm. That's one thought. And the last volcano nearby that erupted was 12,000 years before that. And so does this picture represent an ancestral memory of a volcanic eruption? That's an interesting question. And so it really makes you wonder, just sort of like Troy. Troy was discovered when people thought it was a myth and it was a real place. And so I think our culture is inclined to discount oral history. So oral history, of course, was written down at one point. And, and so in Mesopotamia, there's the gods that were worshipped are more like humans and human behaviors. But the Jews or the, the Hebrews developed a, a very different view of God, that God created everything, the heavens and the earth, and, and that man chose to know God, no, chose to know good and evil, and in a sense to be like God and perhaps even to compete with God. And that, I think, in many ways was Satan's temptation is to be God themselves. Right. And so, well, what about Adams? Well, the first time Adams show up is in some Indian uh, the continental Indian uh, theories had uh, schools had elaborate theories about how atoms combine into more complicated objects, and then Democritus and you know thought talked thought about atoms, and then Epicurus built on this with the idea of an unchangeable atom, and then extrapolated from that, saying if there's atoms are unchangeable, that means they've always existed, and if they've always existed, there's no creation, and if there's no creation or no God, then why there wouldn't be any gods? I mean, if it's always existed. And so Epicurus argued that people would suffer less if they were not afraid of gods, and this became the beginning of atheism. But it quickly developed into hedonism, which is if there's no purpose, then what else is there to do than seek pleasure? Eat, drink, and be merry. Exactly. Yeah. So, uh, so clearly, Adams got linked with atheism. And in that sense, we're opposed to theism. Right. So the and Romans All had, because they thought that these atoms could last forever. Yeah. Yeah. And so the Romans had little use for hedonism because that doesn't help building an empire. And so Stoicism was more important. Um, and then Jesus and Paul also argue against atheism. And uh, Rome destroys Jerusalem and Christians refuse to worship Caesar. So hedonism and atheism became suppressed. And they were suppressed for a long time, about 1,500 years. And so in that intervening time, Christianity spread throughout Europe, really became part of inextricably tangled up with politics from Constantine onward. So Augustine uh, brought in Greek views of logic into Christian ideas, and with those came the celestial spheres of Ptolemy, which created a problem later. Um, and then there's gradual development of wealth in monasteries, which is an outcome of self-discipline, and then wealth attracts the ambitious and the powerful, and corruption in the church is not hard to imagine. And then Islam spreads throughout the Middle East. Charlemagne became the first king of the Holy Roman Empire and was crowned in Aachen. And when we visited there, it was striking to me how in the, uh, right above the throne of Charlemagne, there's Jesus watching. Oh, wow. Yeah. So that kings were under the authority of Jesus, which was an idea that was, wasn't common because a king is the final word on anything that they say. And so... Then Pope Gregory states that the Pope is superior to kings, and, and that sort of builds the uh, author authority basis for the Crusades. And then the uh, Wycliffe and Hus criticize corruption in the church, which is cyclical throughout the history. Renaissance develops in Italy and Northern Europe, and, and then with that comes the reemergence of Greek ideas. 
And, uh, and for example, Machiavelli was influenced by Greek ideas and even Epicurus and atheism. And, and he wrote ad, uh, advising church leaders that use of deception and force was justifiable, which was clearly not part of what the Bible generally teaches. So, of course, Lutheran and Tyndall and others were involved in the Reformation, translating it so that people could read the Bible for themselves. And then Copernicus and Kepler, they were strong believers in God. And for me, one of the most inspirational statements from Kepler, Oh God, I am thinking thy thoughts after thee, has mm -hmm. always been an inspiration to me because my own research has led me to that feeling many a time that this is really amazing to see what God has done and that we could understand it. So in the 1600s, uh, there's lot, lots of wars and Catholics and Protestants justify their actions on the basis of religious issues and a lot of Amer Europeans settle in the U.S. to get away from it all, to escape politicized Christianity. The beginning of the modern area came with Bacon the idea of progressivism, the sense that things are getting better or the things that are, or we're learning more, we're able to understand more. And so this whole sense of knowledge as power became a very strong motivator. But this came in the context of Greek ideas coming in too. So atheistic ideas started getting mixed with the whole development of science. And so Galileo uh, and his trying to promoting the Copernican view, uh, just got tangled up with the church's insistence on a T Ptolemaic view and uh, created these tensions that we've lived with ever since. And I think a statement that uh, from Galileo that philosophy is written in this grand book of the universe in the language of mathematics is one that was very prescient. It's certainly true today in, in the way that we understand so much. And, and to me, one of the most significant things that took place was Archbishop Usher's in, uh, treat, uh, working out by the basis of reason, you know, a 4004 BC creation date. And that uh, certainly was part of the tension that I grew up with, my, with my dad as a geologist, thinking that the earth has got to be older than that. I think it was thing. October 3rd, 9 a.m. He got it down to the very hour. <laughs> <laughs> it's really <laughs> remarkable that they would have such confidence, but uh, I agree. So then atheistic ideas continued to permeate science in the sense of Descartes and Spinoza with arguments about reason, and then Hobbes actually applies reason to explain human society. And then Adams finally reemerge in 1661 with Boyle and his gas constant experiments. And then Adams continued to... Uh, be understood. Of course, Newton uh, invents the calculus and then talks about God of the gaps. Anything we don't understand well is probably God is behind it, makes it happen. In the Enlightenment, there's so much learning that's taking place and people are figuring things out more and more. And the question comes, do we really need God to make sense out of all this? And so this growth of deism that God is distant or humanism that man is great just becomes heady, and people really like that idea that we're that we are really great. And of course, capitalism takes place, and as a metallurgist, I can't not show the first iron bridge in on the Severn River, and uh, this was a major boasting action to say, "Look what we can do." Of course, atoms continue to be understood and, and figured out, and the way combustion works. Basically, the practice of reason leads to separation between religion, politics, and science. And, uh, and then Laplace has his famous, it's a, it's a quote, but it may not be a true quote, but it's something that's attributed to him, that I have no need of that hypothesis. That is the hypothesis that God is behind things we right. don't understand. Right. So atheistic ideas continue to grow into the realm of science and discovery and then William Smith establishes geology that find and argues that the earth is so much older than the 4004 BC creation date, which then makes it easy to start discrediting the Bible, especially amongst the scientific community. 
But there are many other scientists who are strong believers in God who do amazing things like Faraday or Maxwell. But Darwin's origin of the species needs an infinitely old universe, and so an atheistic foundation is, is very helpful for making that make sense. And then that is so appealing to so many people that it becomes social Darwinism and it justifies all kinds of uh, isms and such. Uh, and then Maxwell and Gibbs established the basis for so much of what happens in material science and physics and all of the sciences. One of my favorite quotes there is, mathematics is a language, and, and a mathematician may say anything he pleases, but a physicist must be at least partially sane. <laughs> <laughs> I always giggle at that. But this is the point I want to get to, is that around this time, science is getting more and more mathematical, and it's harder for everybody to follow the math. And so... There is this divergence that takes place between liberal education and physical science. So I want to actually follow two paths. Okay. One that follows the outcome of liberal education and social Darwinism to the materialistic culture that we live in today. And then well, I'll let come me back. give you a context. I mean, a couple hundred years ago, cosmology <clears throat> was dominated by the vicars of Britain and France. But what happened is that it became highly mathematical. And as one famous cosmologist pointed out, we got rid of all the priests and vicars with a straightforward application of tensor calculus. <laughs> <laughs> so true. But yeah. there are still some priests and vicars that are cosmologists. Well, there has to be because yeah. it's compelling to, yes. to use the math and to make sense out of things. So Nietzsche's comments about God is dead and the modern man has killed him is Sounds like bad news to some, but good news to others. He said, we don't need God. We can figure it out for ourselves, and even with a sense of optimism. And so this view that scientific naturalism will be able to predict everything by the turn of the century was you know, present in you know, the late 1800s. And in that time, uh, White uh, removes sectarian or Christian context from university at Cornell. was really the first to do this. And then Carnegie offered big money to remove religious content from universities, which is something most people aren't aware of. Right. So you know, big schools like University of Michigan or Northwestern, you know, were religious schools, but they, they Harvard, gave that up. Princeton, yeah. yeah, Yale. So, but then there's a counterexample of Rice. It was founded to promote secular humanism, but it's the one campus where I found a lot of Bible-believing professors. So it's in the South, so that yeah. helps. But, yeah, it's, it's but that is remarkable. It's the reverse Harvard. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. So, of course, Christian fundamentalists reject this trajectory, and then, of course, they're easily ridiculed because they reject it. And so, well, after World War I, the optimistic progressivism, you know, is dead because it's such a horrible event. And, and so the nihilism starts growing in pessimism and pessimism and these dark questions like, are we just meat or biological machines? And then the Cold War and the fear of nuclear winter and really brings back the sense of hedonism. If that's pleasure is all that you get to have, we could die tomorrow. And so, right. so and then there's further, you know, problems with how subjective is science after all, as Polanyi, Polanyi and Kuhn point out. And, um, uh, and then Dewey's promotion of experiential education, that the child is the authority, so that the whole sense of any wisdom of elder, so to speak, is, is questioned. Uh, and that's certainly true in the education field more and more as time goes on. And then the hippies doing what comes naturally. I mean, it's about 100 years after Darwin. They're just following natural instincts and plans and, or, or in, in, uh, and basically, selfish motivations prevail. And in the postmodern area, we have all this absolute relativism and pluralism and, and a multiversity rather than a university. But, I, you know, it's interesting to me that they still insist on calling it a university. And when it isn't, it's they really promote multiple points of view and that there is no universal point of view. And uh, And then... Uh, an outcome of all of this is tribalism or branding being the basis of identity. 
And there was this clothing uh, brand called Define Your Own Existence that was out for a while, 10 or 20 years ago, which I thought was just amazingly provocative. And Somehow that bypassed me. <laughs> but, you know, I didn't buy any, but... I, <laughs> But to me, the statement is is something that we take for granted today is that everybody's expected to define their own existence and their own truth and their own basis for reality. And, you know, and it sort of leads to the frame of mind that nobody's going to tell me what to do, think, say, or act. And, and that's... And also along with this trend is this commodification of humans, that, that marketing and economics defines who a person is or, or what their value is or the sense of lifeboat theory. Only some people are more valuable than others. And so this survival of the fittest is measured by control of feelings, money, and power, which leads to a lot of loneliness, mistrust, and fear, which is epidemic in young people especially today. So to contrast that, following the trail of what has happened in the physical science and the divergence from that track, well, the atom starts coming apart and, uh, and the infinitely old universe unravels in the 20th century and started with Thompson with the electron and, and Rutherford with nucleus and of course, just the general greater and greater understanding of what an atom is. Um, basically, unwittingly, is undoing the atheistic foundation, which nobody realizes. It's not, you're not allowed to talk about that. And, and, and this continues as the more and more depth of understanding about atoms and, and the uncertainties about atoms and the need for probability to make sense out of what happens at the atomic scale. And so, of course, this the sense of um, uncertainty makes Eastern religious ideas interesting from the point of view of physics too, and that gets brought in along along the side. But then Hubble discovers the universe is expanding, so the Big Bang theory develops, and it's not an infinitely old universe. So here too, the, the fundamental atheistic assumptions are, are being undone, but again, people don't recognize how significant that is. And the, the continuation of the understanding of the pieces of the atom, I mean, getting down to Weinberg's standard model, where it is such a good model that uh, people are still trying to find ways to say there's something wrong with it. And, uh, but I think his own comment is especially intriguing because he was an atheist and he said the more the universe seems comprehensible the more also it seems pointless and that's it sort of reminds me also about Einstein and his desire to make the universe infinitely old with his cosmological constant that, that they were educated by people who were not mathematicians and thus they tried to view the their science through that set of lenses. Well, I remember in the early part of the uh, 20th century where uh, the Big Bang was beginning to be accepted. So they said, well, we can't tolerate this idea that it's only billions of years old. And so they were looking at the physics of stars. This is before they understood nucleosynthesis. They were thinking, well, uh, you know, to explain all the elements we see in the universe, these stars had to be burning for trillions of years. And if the universe is quadrillions of years old, maybe we can save Darwin's ideas on the origin and history of life. But then there was these upstarts that said, no, the universe is young. It's only 10 to 20 billion years old. And you know the rest of the story. Yep. A young universe astronomers won. It's only billions of years old. But they were bitterly fought because people realize if it's only billions, we can't save naturalistic evolution. Yeah. All these hidden agendas. Right. And so one another story that really illustrates this, you know, in addition to all of the popularization of science that came through Dawkins and Sagan, people are less aware of the significance of Fang Lejeune in China, that, that he was trying to introduce modern physics understanding and the Big Bang Theory into the Chinese physics community. But he got criticized for this because it, 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 uh, it contradicted atheism. 
and that was not allowed. The politically. irony, he himself was an atheist. I know. But, but nevertheless, he said, hey, we can't avoid the obvious the implications. implication that right. the universe has a beginning. Yeah. So another thing that has intrigued me is in Hawking's book, the very front page of it says, to know the mind of God. And to me, that's really an, an interesting statement because it is a very different kind of a statement than Kepler's statement. This is a statement that says it's possible for humans to know the mind of God. And if you know the mind of God, then how close to God are you becoming? And are you actually declaring yourself to be almost God or God? Well, I heard him speak at Caltech, and he says, you know, I'm not just wanting to find a theory of everything where we understand how the four fundamental forces of physics unify and work together. I want a real theory of everything where I know the answer to free will, yeah. Where I know, <coughs> excuse me, where I know everything that God knows, 100% of everything that God knows. Wow, that's quite and a statement. It is. <clears throat> and I remember sitting there at Caltech saying, you know what, someone said that many years ago, and it's in the very first part of the Bible. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, it didn't work out too well for that uh, individual. So yep. uh, kind of, it was scary for me to hear uh, Hockey make that statement. Wow. So, you were there, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Interesting. So I've been on, on the edge of the particle accelerator world, and of course this has just continued our understanding of, uh, of atoms, and, and basically I think one of the most interesting experiences I had was at a conference in 2012, just after the Higgs boson was identified. Mm -hmm. It's a Japanese physicist who gave a plenary talk, and he was somebody who had built his whole career as a theoretical physicist on assuming the Higgs boson didn't exist. And he said, I cried, and Japanese men don't cry. Yeah. <laughs> and, and then he said, as a proper Japanese, I should have killed myself. But, but he thought about it long and hard and decided, I can't do it. I, I'm just too curious to see what's going to happen next. Yeah. So that's... So, of course, in the... Of uh, many other things have taken place in the 90s, and since then, that has really challenged atheism. So, argument or debates in the 90s were basically became clear that atheism requires faith, so, and you know, in unifying gravity, electromagnetic, weak and strong forces, and string theory, it just takes physics outside the realm of 3D and time, and and the anthropic principle, and. So I, I try to point out to students at this point that we really do have a choice about how we view ourselves, how we view atoms, and you know, <clears throat> we still have the option to say, aren't we clever? Or we can be in awesome wonder about God's creation or possibly both in some kind of a mixed way. Mm -hmm. And so just summarizing this whole <laughs> sense of Survival of the fittest justifies ambition and, and tyranny and, and all kinds of ills that we live with today in our popular culture. And, and social sciences and arts and humanities are really so, sort of stuck in a Darwinian paradigm because they haven't experienced the math, the transformational effects of... Well, I notice in this chart here, you have this little dotted line basically showing how uh, the humanities are beginning to, and then sciences. So are you saying that there's a real hope that uh, these two are going to come together? Well, actually, I'm saying right now they're, they're diverging. They're diverging. So the blue line says that science is becoming less atheistic, and the orange line says that science is becoming more Christian in the sense that the sense of God is becoming perhaps even necessary. And... The, the sort of an outcome of the, the people who argue for our culture or who um, say that our culture is defined by an atheistic agenda have really made almost a sense of polytheism becoming more important because everyone is their own god and they define their own reality. Where science is saying something different. Science is saying maybe God is becoming not only plausible, but perhaps even necessary. And so that undoes the scientific or the foundation of atheism, but again, we're not allowed to talk about it because it's politically incorrect. 
And so in our culture is schizophrenic, truly, because the cell phones and all the electronics and everything that we do is based upon the fact that atoms can be pulled apart, electrons moving at will, and so much other amazing stuff that happens in sensors and not just not only metals where electrons can be dissociated, but ceramics and polymers that are a big part of all of our uh, technical world. So, you know, obviously we need the author of life to heal us from the schizophrenia, this cultural schizophrenia that we're living in because this, this contradiction is in front of us every day. Paul, well, all this that you've been sharing with us tells me you're leading up to a climax that there is a cure. Yes. So uh, what's the cure? Well, the cure is that we say that God is God and I am not and, and worship God. And uh, your own discipline is basically establishing we can't get around the fact that atoms are a miracle. Yeah. We need them. They need or, to be or, just... or in my view, that life is a miracle. Right. Whenever I, I, I taught thermodynamics for a number of years, and uh, it, it just struck me over and over again that, uh, you know, the, the conservation of energy that one life has given up for another is really embedded in that very basic idea. And even the sense of sacrifice, the, the entropic, I mean, free energy is energy minus T delta S, or the entropic energy, and that's like a sacrifice. We sacrifice some energy to get the energy we get to use. Right. It's a deep idea that's consistent with Jesus' example of giving up his life so that others can live, and that he's asked us in, in our own lives to give up our own desire to be God. And by doing so, we get to use all kinds of good things that he, he would give us in, in terms of what we can do with our life. So thermodynamics isn't necessarily bad. We need it to live. Oh, absolutely. But to me, it makes life miraculous because life is so complex and so complicated. And this sort of gets to this question that I put on the final exam for this class. It's an extra credit final question. Can Adams think? And before we... The last lecture I give before that, that is a little bit about self-assembly, about how biological processes happen in an aqueous environment, and that is very organized. There's templates, there's guidance, and this whole sense that life is amazingly, just totally amazing to me as somebody who deals mostly with inanimate things. Uh, I don't understand, you know, the why of it. I, I understand and appreciate that people can figure out the mechanisms of it, but, but they never ad address the why. Or how can this be so? So at least in my mind, I'm convinced that we live because God wills us to live every nanosecond of our life. And that to me is, is a reason to worship. Yeah, right there in the Colossians. So, yes, right. indeed. Okay. So there's answers that three sorts of answers that I get from students about okay. can Adams think after going through this class. Those who are clearly atheistically identified um, say, yes, Adams can think, because I think they instinctively realize that if they, they have to think, otherwise life is too complicated to exist. But in some ways, that's absurd. Others say that they can't think in the way sentient beings think, but they're responsive to their environment, but that, that's a, sort of like an agnostic response. It mm -hmm. says, I know there's a problem there, but I'm not going to I'm go not going to bother to try to solve it. <laughs> and then there's others say no, because they're not alive, you know, and, it, but that, it's, it's a half-baked answer, but they still recognize that it's absurd to think of atoms thinking independently. Right. Very good. Well, let me segue to what I'm going to be talking about sure. here. And uh, it's a paper that was published in Nature Energy. This is the paper right here. Yep. And uh, it's all about uh, a study done over a decade about the uh, costs of getting electricity from different sources. And it's based on a 40-page online document that was produced by a large team of scientists. And then they wound up producing a chart basically saying, if you look at the past 10 years, we see that the price of generating electricity from coal 
has basically been stable. Yep. It dropped by about 1%. That's all, you know, because we got a little more efficient in being able to uh, build uh, power plants that use coal. But we only got a 1% or 2% gain. Right. Uh, whereas with natural gas, we got a huge, I mean, right. natural gas used to be prohibitively expensive yeah. for generating electricity. Uh, now it's uh, become uh, much cheaper. And then they looked at uh, wind and they looked at nuclear. Uh, they looked at, um, uh, you know, photovoltaic cells. Mm -hmm. And they said that's where you see the greatest drop right. in uh, cost and uh, how uh, it's now... 10 times cheaper to get energy from photovoltaic cells than it was just a decade ago. Yeah, it's really amazing. And I mean, this is really what motivates engineering is this whole efficiency. This whole efficiency thing. Yeah. So I was reading through all this and said, you know, I noticed the huge drop in natural gas costs. And it's like, it's a gas. It's not a solid like coal. Yeah. Why isn't it cheaper than coal? And then I kind of dug into the literature and realized, well, the reason why is that we have governments around the world that are basically saying we're not going to develop the natural gas. Hmm. I mean, even in this country, there are natural gas wells that are tapped. They're not being used. And so we have the potential of driving the price of electricity from natural gas way below coal, uh, but there are regulations that are basically making it difficult, more expensive. Um, and mainly because I think there's this idea we shouldn't be burning any fossil fuels yeah. at all. And here in America, people realize, hey, we burn coal, we're going to get a lot of particulates, there's going to be bad for public health, uh, but they're not willing to release the spigot mm. on natural gas. Uh, but I also was very much impressed how uh, you know, the ability to get electricity from nuclear fission has dropped significantly. Uh, and of course, in physics, there's a big effort on trying to get electricity from nuclear fusion. Yep. And I remember when I was just in my teens, uh, way back in the 60s, and they were saying, by the end of the uh, 20th century... It's always 30 years out. We're going to have all this cheap electricity from yep. nuclear fusion. It's going to be a done deal. Well, here we are in 2023, and we still aren't anywhere close yeah. to being able to generate electricity. But part of that is the materials necessary to contain it. Well, yeah. I mean, the sun does it through gravity, mm. but you need a lot of gravity <laughs> to contain the helium and, uh, and the hydrogen yeah. and to get the hydrogen, pro you know, the protons close yeah. enough together. We're trying to do with magnetic fields. Yeah. We're trying to do with lasers. Yeah. And the problem, you know, I, you know, we both studied the electromagnetic theory. It's very difficult to stabilize uh, anything uh, with electromagnetism. Yes. And so there's been some success, but nowhere near what we need uh, to actually have a nice stable fusion reaction going on yeah. where you get a lot more energy out than you put in trying to <clears throat> build this electromagnetic container uh, to keep the uh, protons close enough together to get something uh, and of course I think there's a lot of public reaction against this yeah. because with nuclear fission you got these uh, you know toxic radioactive waste that hang around a long time 50,000 years and who knows what the safety regulations will be even 10,000 years from now let alone 50,000 and then even with the nuclear fusion I notice all the emphasis is on fusing deuterium with tritium mm -hmm. And tritium is nasty. Yeah. It's a really nasty uh, radioactive material. Completely different from the sun, where they take uh, protons, you know, simple hydrogen, and you get helium. Nothing radioactive. Mm -hmm. However, trying to contain uh, the protons to make helium, uh, from an electromagnetic perspective, people just think it's impossible. <laughs> uh, and, hey, we can't even do it to tritium and tritium. So they're saying... And of course, it's easy with the sun because it can use gravity. Right. So Yeah, we just don't have that trick. We don't have that trick. You need something as big as the sun to pull it off. So uh, yeah. hardly well, practical. One of the most interesting courses I was ever a part of was one that I didn't invent, but a, a grad student actually asked me and others to, to put together. And it was a course on nuclear energy and policy. 
And the thing that was so astonishing to me is just how public perception is so much at the heart of this. Yeah, it's public perception, which is why I think this 40-page document mm. has real value. It's very readable. You don't have to be you know, a nuclear physicist to understand yep. what's going on there or a material scientist like yourself to figure it out. Highly readable. But it's like, the, and the whole point of the paper published in Nature Energy, which is just three pages, it's a short paper, again, highly readable. It's just saying, look what's happened over the 10 years. We can extrapolate this. The prices are going to continue to drop. And basically making the point, it is true that a currently functioning coal-burning electrical plant will be cheaper than trying to get electricity from wind uh, or from, uh, you know, uh, photovoltaic cells if you have to build it. Yeah. But what they're pointing out is already uh, in the 2023 it's cheaper. If you want to build a new electric power generating plant, already wind and solar are cheaper than coal and natural gas. Right. Coal and natural gas win because they already exist. Right. You don't have to build a new plant. If you're talking about building new energy sources, and of course we need new energy sources, they say already uh, wind and solar is cheaper than trying to do with coal and natural gas. And then also it's cheaper than trying to build a nuclear fission plant, uh, especially with all the regulations that are in place. Uh, But I've been on record saying there's one nuclear power source that people have been overlooking, and that's thorium. Yep. And uh, we had thorium nuclear reactors in the early 1960s. They were small nuclear reactors. They were never developed because you can't make nuclear weapons from the energy you get from thorium, whereas you can from uranium. And, uh, but today, that's kind of an advantage. Uh, we could actually give a thorium nuclear reactor uh, to generate electricity to North Korea and not worry that they're going to use that to make nuclear weapons. Yep. So uh, we don't have to worry about terrorism. Right. And uh, you know, with a thorium, uh, you don't have these long-lasting nuclear wastes. Uh, the period is only 50 to 200 years. Right. And in fact, I think you could use these reactors to burn up existing nuclear waste in a careful way and actually right. use the existing waste as fuel and may just make it disappear. It would take 100 years to do it, but it could be done. It could be done. But what really gets me is the price. Uh, the energy you get from thorium nuclear reactors is 300 times yeah. what you get from uranium. So you get way more energy. Thorium is three times more abundant. It's safe to mine. You don't have to wear special clothing. Yep. It's impossible to have a meltdown in your thorium nuclear yep. reactor. But the problem, though, is the engineering. I mean, you know, you're in an engineering discipline. It's going to take time to scale up yeah. these tiny thorium nuclear reactors that we know work and get them big enough where they can generate significant electricity. But, but I've also wondered that there's an idea that has been proposed in in miniature nuclear reactors, not miniature in the sense of tiny, but small enough that they fit on the back of a truck. And you could get a dozen of them arranged that would generate the same power. Well, I know Bill Gates is pushing that with yeah. these uh, nuclear uh, uranium breeder reactors. Yeah. You know, I think he's got something, you know, that if you can make millions of these tiny right. reactors you, you instead of a few big of ones. You scale. And if you're manufacturing uh, hundreds of thousands of these things, you can drop the price down. That's right, like solar cells. And maybe we need to think about doing that with thorium. I think that's a a really important direction because it it eliminates so much of the nuclear waste problem. Yeah, because it's so much. Well, when I talked to nuclear engineers about this, I said, "Here's the problem: we got all the engineering figured out for fission reactors." We don't have it all figured out That's for true. thorium reactors because nobody's bothered done it. to yeah. scale up and say, where is the cost benefits? Yeah. But my whole point is, I think it can be done. I think it can be done within a decade. Uh, but I'm also making the point, we need to buy time. We're not in a position yet where we can get all of our power from wind uh, or true. solar. And uh, one problem with solar is you got to take agricultural land out of production. Actually, that's not true. One of my colleagues has been developing uh, 
polymer-based solar cells. And he's got uh, a contract with Anderson Windows to install them between two panes of glass and basically make every window a source of power. So and, you and could what actually it does have... is filters out the wavelengths that you don't want and converts that to electricity, but lets the wavelengths you do want to get through. So the photosynthetic wavelengths get through? You can do it that way. And so he's actually working on a project with people in, in the um, agricultural school to, with the idea that you could set up these collectors over agricultural land and let the wavelengths that the plants need through and yeah, that'd be great because I've been in places that are agriculturally rich and they basically yeah. take out the agricultural land and replace them with solar panels. Yeah. And it's like, that's really valuable soil uh, where you've got lots of rain and sunshine. Yeah. Instead of producing food, you're producing electricity. But what if you could have your cake and eat it that's too? That's true. It's yeah. possible. It's possible. So it's with these polymer-based semiconductors that they can be tuned uh, for the appropriate extraction of just certain wavelengths of light. Well, one research paper I looked at said, you know, here in California, uh, our government makes it very uh, cost-effective thanks to their tax laws to put solar panels on your roof. But there's a new technology whereby when it's time for you to replace your roof, the entire roof becomes a solar panel. And... uh, I looked at the projections. They say probably within five years, hmm. uh, you'll be able to replace your roof with a roof that makes electricity, the entire surface of the roof, just as efficiently as covering it with solar panels mm-hmm. for the same price of replacing your roof where there's no electricity generation at all. I mean, wow. that's kind of a no-brainer, right? If yes. you've got to replace your roof, you might as well get free electricity while right. you're at it. Right. So It's just the infrastructure necessary to... To get well, that out this there. is why I'm an optimist. Yeah. This global warming debate that we're dealing with, yeah. uh, I think we can get past this just based on the fact that the prices are coming down. Yeah. Uh, but I'm also thinking we're overlooking natural gas in the sense that when you burn natural gas, you release only 50 to 60 percent of the greenhouse gases mm-hmm. that you do with coal because, right. I mean, it's CH4. so. Right. A lot of what you're doing makes water. Yes. Water is a greenhouse gas, uh, but if you pump lots of water vapor in the atmosphere, it comes down as rain and snow. Right. So even though it's a powerful greenhouse gas, no matter how much water you put in the atmosphere, it seems to stabilize. It's it's not like carbon dioxide yeah. where it accumulates and you get more and more heat trapped from the sun. So the fact that you drop the carbon dioxide level Uh, by nearly a factor of two when you stop burning coal and burn natural gas. And, of course, with natural gas, you've got no black carbon uh, soot. There's no particulates. There's no sulfur aerosols. And uh, one paper I was reading was talking about the problem in the Ganges Valley of India, uh, where they're now estimating that due to these coal-burning plants that are generating electricity, Uh, You've got 500,000 people dying every year uh, from lung diseases that are 100% generated by all the particulates from coal burning. And so the Indian government is saying, maybe we need to switch to natural gas. I mean, the Americans have done it, the Canadians have done it, the Western Europeans have done it for health reasons. Right. However, the problem is we need to make the natural gas more available. There's lots of natural gas. And uh, I, and when I talk to environmentalists, I say, look, I know you're against fossil fuels, but where else can you get a 40 to 50% drop in carbon dioxide emissions overnight? There's no other solution. I mean, you know, solar, yes, you get rid of it all, but it takes time. Yep. But natural gas, you get an immediate uh, benefit, and that will buy you time to let these prices let drop. These other- and then you won't have to burn any fossil fuels at all. Yeah. Uh, but if you put a total ban on it, guess what's going to happen? People keep burning coal. Yeah. So, and that's going to pump more greenhouse gases. People won't be healthier. Uh, let's use, in a wise way, the fossil fuels that we have to solve uh, the global warming problem. So. Yeah, there are 
solutions that can be done that are viable. There's so much momentum, and, and it sort of brings, you know, it gets back to the sort of selfishness that comes naturally to us all. Uh, those who have power want to keep it, and especially the power that, like coal power, I mean, that's, that's a large fraction of of our economy, and so that seems like a threat. And so then political pressures slow it down. Well, I've heard that, uh, you know, talking to political people, it's like, you know, uh, there are certain states in the U.S. where they get a lot of income from mining and selling coal. Yep. Uh, but America is sitting on huge resources of natural gas. Yes, we will lose money by not mining and selling the coal, but we'll make a whole lot more yep. from mining and selling the natural gas. And I think that principle applies worldwide. Yep. So, well, I mean, you're an engineer, uh, so this is something I think is right up your alley. It uh, is, but, but, but the big part of engineering is the public policy side, and that's a hard thing to convince engineers that it's worth thinking about. Yes, and uh, as long as uh, you've got people with uh, a political agenda, yeah. it can get in the way. It does, yeah. However, if you can push the economic value of it yes. to a sufficient degree, persuade the politicians, hey, there's going to be more income, you get more tax money, I mean, you politicians always want more tax money, but if you can boost the economy, so, you know, let's look for these win-win solutions. That's right. So uh, uh, let's stimulate things rather than tax things out of existence. Yep. So, all right. Well, I think let's try to wrap this sure. up. Sure. Uh, thank you for joining us today on Star Cells and God. You can join the discussion in the comments below. And remember to like the video and to subscribe for more content. Uh, new episodes of Star Cells and God release every Wednesday and are available uh, from uh, uh, YouTube uh, or your favorite podcast app. And be sure to share this uh, video with a friend. And remember, the more we know about science, the more reasons we have to believe and trust in Jesus Christ as Creator, Lord, and Savior. Thank you.